Hey, I'm Dan Harris. I am a fidgety, skeptical newsman who had a panic attack live on Good Morning America. To prescribe statins slowly for cancer production. That led me to something I always thought was ridiculous, meditation. I wrote a book about it, launched an app, and now I'm starting this podcast to try to figure out if there's anything beyond 10%. Basically, here's what I'm obsessed with. Can you be an ambitious person who is nonetheless striving for enlightenment, whatever that means? Let's start the show. Okay, so uh, my guest today is somebody you may have heard of. His name is His Holiness the Dalai Lama, pretty well-known guy. Thank you for joining us today, really appreciate it. Right back at you. And uh, alongside His Holiness is Richie Davidson. I guess formally you're known as Richard Davidson, but your friends call you Richie and I'm one of your friends. Uh, you are uh, one of, if not the leading neuroscientist who's looked at the impact of meditation on the brain. And you're also the head, head of the Center for Healthy Minds, which is organizing a, a, a major event here in Madison, Wisconsin, where we are today. We're in a back hallway in the, um, in the, the, in the major organization where we'll be holding this event later today. So no expense has been spared in this hallway. Um, thank you again for joining us. The two of you have worked for a long time collaboratively on science around meditation on the brain. Why is, you're a religious leader, why is this science so important to you? Actually, uh, firstly, uh, since my childhood, personally, since childhood, I have, you see, uh, one of my nature is curiosity. Mm. So that brings interest about science and technology. Uh, then secondly, science really, I think, provide the well-being of the world or humanity. And there are sort of concept, open mind, and carry research and uh, through investigation. Uh, investigation. You see, till something concrete sort of, it, it, sort of the evidence there, you see, your mind open. That I, lo I like, you see, that kind of attitude. So, uh, science, uh, very important for humanity, for even for our world also, it's very important. But in the meantime, the modern science up to now, mainly dealing with matters, or particles, uh, not sufficient pay or not sufficient development, the uh, what you call mind or consciousness. So then, we are dealing with human being. So we human being, beside this physical, we have this experience, whatever you call, mind or consciousness or something. So we cannot sort of. Uh, aside, is it that? Exclude. Ex exclude. Uh, so now, now obviously, physically healthy person, but actually uh, there are people very unhappy person. I know a lot. So, so physical medication uh, fail to bring inner peace. So we have to, we have to deal with peace of mind. So since main sort of uh, destroyer of peace of mind is our own different emotion. So therefore, I think obviously that drug problem and alcohol problem, they not necessarily, you see, consider these is something sacred or something good, but to some extent out of desperate, you see, they're putting hope, some injection drugs or alcohol, like that. So this clearly shows a society, uh, no matter how sort of materially highly developed, but still uh, some too much stress, too much worry, too much anxiety going on. So if there is no way to deal these problem, uh, then okay, we have to rely on these drugs or these things. 
But if there is way, you see, to deal this problem, then we must exploit, explore, explore. like that. So then, uh, what you call meditation or some other sort of training of mind. I usually prefer training of mind. Sometimes it's the word meditation. I don't know. You see, simply it's a training. And meditation, there are variety of, uh, varieties or different kinds of meditation. Basically, uh, analytical meditation and uh, single-pointed sort of a meditation. meditation. So usually you see people consider meditation means close eye like that and mind not thinking or sometimes we call thoughtlessness state of mind. I mean, you, you can't remain whole your life thoughtlessness. <laughs> I can't do it for five seconds. <laughs> okay, I'm then, not sure I can do then, it for one second. Uh, <laughs> so actually, I think uh, sometimes I describe you see, one of the, because of the best gift from God is this intelligence. So without using our intelligence, is quite pity. So without using our intelligence? Or intelligence, yes. Yeah. So the uh, analytical meditation goes very well. Analytical meditation and research and in intelligence go together. Actually, I often, you see, mentioning my friend, you see, they also, in the, in the laboratory uh, research work, they also, you see, use intensively about analytical meditation. During that period, you see, fully concentrate on particular subject, the uh, hearing or this or smelling, not active. So, you see, some, because of the noise come, they, I mean, he may not sort of at attend it or attend. No, no, pay attention. Pay attention. Because you see, mind f fully concentrate in a certain point and research thinking, thinking, thinking. So that is analytical meditation. I feel, according to my own experience, the emotions also, you see, have some, some low level of intelligence. So combat or counterforce, destructive emotion. Also, you see, need the extensive sort of intelligence back, because of backing, backing. just uh, thoughtlessness state, thoughtlessness, temporary, okay, but long run, the effect, I think, limited. So you've said a bunch of things there that I want to react to and get you to clarify a little bit. First of all, I want to tell our listeners and viewers that occasionally, even though your English is very good, you do turn to your translator mm. to yes. help for yes. a word. So if you're hearing another voice there, that's what it is. Um, and I want to talk about the difference between analytical meditation and the more traditional kind of meditation that most, that to the extent that anybody meditates, most people do. But before I ask about that, I just want to bring Richie in. Because I, I want to give you credit. Your collaboration, which has brought some evidence behind the practice of meditation has allowed for people like me to start meditating. I never would have meditated if there wasn't evidence because I always thought it was only for weirdos. Um, and so I, I, would, I, would have, I would have completely rejected the practice had you not come forth with this scientific evidence. So Richie, let me just ask you, in your work with His Holiness, do you think that you're sparking the next big public health revolution here? Well, I, I do think that there is, uh, we, we view it as a public health issue. Uh, we take the position that uh, health is not simply the absence of illness, and most people really have some residual level of suffering if they're honest about their own state of, of mind. Uh, and we think that uh, these kinds of practices that His Holiness is describing could be useful in helping people to have more of a uh, more peace of mind, to generate more positive emotions uh, in ways that can affect their everyday life. Uh, and so I think that this is uh, a, a very much a public health issue, and it's public health because disturbing emotions we know cause changes in the body that impact our physical health. Uh, and so there is evidence to suggest that people who are happier and who have higher levels of well-being actually have biology which is more conducive to health. 
Uh, and so uh, I think it's very much a public health issue. And our aspiration actually is that these practices can potentially reduce health care costs because it can enable people to be more healthy. So I want to state the obvious. I think we would all agree. The most important evidence is the evidence you will gather if you do the practice. So uh, the, the scientific evidence is compelling, but I don't think people, it may get you to start meditating. I don't think people continue to meditate because they think their prefrontal cortex is getting thicker. They continue to meditate because they're less of a jerk to themselves and others, and it feels better. So uh, I think, I just want to clarify, I do think the most important evidence ultimately is the evidence you will gather in your own personal experience. But along those lines, Your Holiness, you were talking about the difference between uh, the sort of traditional um, shamatha meditation, which is kind of a term of art, but the, the meditation that most of us are taught as beginners, which is to focus on our breath, then when we get lost, yes. we start again. But there's a different kind of meditation, which is analytical meditation. What is that? I think firstly, when you develop some worry, then investigate uh, what is the worry and come from where, from where come and what's the nature. You can't find. So that itself, you see, all, every sort of emotions, usually, you see, we feel some kind of solid or some kind of sort of absolute or strong. When we analyze what the nature or what, what the very identity of uh, sadness or worry you can't find, and momentarily changing. So within second, you see, moving, changing. So analyze, then the appearance of something, or my sadness, something you see here, something solid. solid. Now that no longer there. So if I am feeling anger, which I do occasionally. Um, I think more, everybody. More, uh, everybody, in, including, as I, if you said to me in the past, even the Dalai Lama feels angry at times. You're saying an analytical style of meditation would look for who exactly is angry and where is the anger? Can you find it? And you won't find yes, anything. Yes, both sides. Firstly, object sight. Uh, uh, in the case of one human being who creates you problem and you feel very negative and with that person consider your enemy. And then your anger, uh, really feel angry, his body or his or her body or mind or sound or speech. Anger feels shy, no, no answer. <laughs> but you see, the appearance is something independent, that person. That is a target of anger. So analyze that target and dissolve. dissolve. So anger no longer find independent Basis. Uh, uh, target. Okay. So some sort of scientist uh, mentioned, I think the uh, Aaron Beck, now over 90, I think 96, 70 years old, uh, he uh, found through sort of decades experience, when person develop anger, uh, the object which feel angry appears something very negative. But actually, 90% of that negativeness is mental projection. So, th so therefore, you see the analytical meditation, analyze uh, to whom, what's that person, what's the body. And, uh, uh, quantum physics also, the body appears something independent, body, independent object, but analyze nothing. So nothing objectively exists. So long observer there, things there. So thinking this nature, uh, then uh, the person himself or herself From where, from where anger come? And, and what, what's the sort of 
uh, what is the real entity of anger? You can't find. So that's the way uh, reduce the intensity of anger or fear or even attachment like that. We so all, we all, I'm sorry, go ahead, so, I didn't mean to interrupt you. So therefore, you see, uh, I feel it is something, you see, dealing with root or basis of this destructive emotion. But simply, uh, the thoughtlessness, you see, you, your mind not go that side, just to remain something uh, neutral. That is, withdrawing your mind, yeah. With, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating because I think most of us believe that meditation is just this goal to, to squash our thoughts. But what you're saying is you can use the discursive mind, the thinking mind, to get at the root of our destructive emotions. We walk around with this subconscious assumption that there is some Dan in here, some Dalai Lama behind your eyes. But if you look for it, you won't find it. And that can be a revelation. Let me ask you a a personal and selfish question because it's not every day that I get to sit down with the Dalai Lama. Um, I've been meditating for six years. I was doing about a half hour a day. And then about mm -hmm. nine months ago, I decided, for reasons that I'm not even sure that I can articulate, to go to two hours a day. And so I guess my question for you is, should I have a goal in my practice? I think for, uh, I think the general speaking about well-being of humanity, then our goal should be happy life. Firstly, start individual, then family level, then community level, then finally, entire seven billion human beings through awareness, through education. It is possible. Basic human nature is more compassionate. That also now scientists, you see, they sort of find basic human nature is more compassionate. That really, you see, the uh, basis of our hope. If basic human nature is anger or negative, then useless, make effort. Any effort, if the result will be temporary. But basic human nature is more positive more compassionate. So there is real sort of possibility to build more compassionate world, compassionate humanity, and compassionate world. So utilize our intelligence uh, maximum way to promote basic human value, human nature, compassionate nature. It's interesting to me that when I asked you, should I have a goal, you went directly to improving the situation for all humans. Yes. But the, my reading of the, the suttas, the early Buddhist scriptures, the Buddha himself was talking about enlightenment. You didn't use that word. I'm sort of talking humanity. If hum, entire humanity are Buddhist, then I will talk about Buddhism. <laughs> but that is not the case. Well, what about for, for an individual like me who practices Buddhist meditation. Should my goal be to try to uh, ensure the well-being of all sentient beings, or should my goal be enlightenment? What is enlightenment anyway? Uh, individual case, of course, generally speaking, historically, Western world, uh, uh, non-Buddhist country, Buddhism historically belongs to East, mainly come from India and then China, and so on, these countries. But now in modern time, because of a uh, lot of communication, a lot of information, now as a human being, you see, there are people who are really showing genuine interest and not only interest, but they find some benefit in individual case. So then similarly in Asia, uh, traditionally not Christian country, Judo Christian country or Muslim country, but large number of Christians, large number of uh, Muslims or Jews, it's okay. Uh, it is, religion is concerned, individual's right. Uh, culture is related with the community. So, so uh, there are a number of 
Westerners who really follow uh, Buddhist tradition, Buddhist practice. So if you, uh, so these also you see, have the right. Now one important, I always make clear, individual who really found some uh, effective sort of what's the result through Buddhist practice, and it's his or her right to, to follow that. At the same time, you must respect your own traditional religion. At the time, we are really making effort to promote religious harmony. So, uh, you sh we sh I'm Buddhist uh, from childhood. You see, I never say Buddhism is the best religion. No, according to different people. To some people, you see, certain religion is more effective. So for that person, the religion is best. Like food, you, we can't say thousands different sort of different sort of meals. You can't say this is best or medicine. This medicine is the best. No, we cannot say according individual sort of taste or mental disposition. So therefore, uh, if you uh, if if you have genuine sort of interest uh, about Buddhism, uh, there are two. <laughs> major tradition, uh, Theravada tradition or Pali tradition. That's the foundation of Buddha Dharma. Then another level, the Sanskrit tradition. Obviously, uh, Pali, tradi Pali tradition you see, mainly relying on Buddha's own word or uh, quotation. Uh, the Sanskrit tradition extensively used reasons. So, uh, the special text, logic, also there. Uh, so therefore, I usually use to describe the, uh, the proper or unique uh, Buddhist way of practice is utilize human intelligence in the maximum way, through that way, transform our emotion. Then our ultimate goal is this mind, which up to now a slave of these destructive emotions, ultimately ignorance, is not nature of the mind. If ignorance is nature of the mind, then we cannot learn. Uh, obviously, we, uh, through time, you see, we learn many things. So that means Basic nature of mind is clear light, clear, no, no, no. knowing, knowing. So now Buddha means, enlightened means, you see, the ignorance part reduced, finally completely eliminated. Then the fuller sort of wisdom or awareness developed. That is Buddhahood. So the basis of Buddhahood is clear light mind. Can I get there, or, or can I go beyond 10% happier and get to what you're describing in this lifetime? Well, certainly. I think you are uh, much younger than me. <laughs> so even you Not see, much younger. Uh, even you see the 81-year-old uh, person, you see, making effort to achieve some, some level of enlightenment. So then why not you? You've made my day. <laughs> They're telling us we're, we're out of time, but I can't resist. I'm just going to ask one last question, and this is a more earthly question. I know you follow the news, and you listen to BBC. I'm just curious if you have any views on the presidential candidate in this country who's making the most noise, Donald Trump. Oh, that's your business. Uh, firstly, uh, I have no sort of the right, right, right or opportunity to vote. Hmm? And then secondly, a short sort of uh, visit here. So I do not know the whole sort of background of these things. So sometimes I feel, oh, too much personal criticism. That I feel. Uh, a serious discussion about policy matter is useful. Oh. But there's sometimes a little, little bit sort of personal sort of say, criticism of these things. And that looks a little bit cheap. That's my view. <laughs> you mean the, the personally attacking yes. his opponents? Yes. Uh, yes. Some, uh, 
sometimes the election. See, not only this case. I think a uh, number of cases, you see, the election comes, uh, or there are some stories in India, some Ladakh or Mun. After election, even you see two families, usually you see very close, but then uh, during election, you see one family belongs that, one family belongs that. Then afterward, at least a few years, they remain as a hostile sort of people. Silly. <laughs> uh, there, we are out of time. There are a million question, more questions I could and would ask you if we had more time in this back hallway here in Madison, Wisconsin, but I can't because I want to keep you on your way. But thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Richie. Thank you. I wish I had thank more you, time Dan. to ask you questions, but we'll get you back on this podcast, I promise. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time on 10% Happier. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Very good.